The story is told of a pastor who visited an old lady who lived in an old and very primitive cabin. It did not have any running water, it did not have any electricity, it had only a tiny little window and was heated by a stove. It was dark in there. And when he entered the room, he immediately noticed that because of the fire in the stove and because of the fact that the window was closed, the air in the room was pretty bad. So the pastor turned to the woman and said, Sister, I think you need some oxygen in this room. And the old woman just stared at him with a strange look that signaled a lack of understanding and said, Oxygen? What kind of newfangled thing is this? I don't need any oxygen. All I need is some air to breathe. We might smile about this story, but it seems to me that some people have a similar approach when it comes to biblical hermeneutics. Hermeneu what? They say. Hermeneutics? What kind of newfangled thing is this? I don't need any hermeneutics, they say. I simply take my Bible as it reads. And many people claim they need no interpretation. They just read their Bibles very literalistic. What can be wrong with that? Perhaps you had similar thoughts or heard people entertain this kind of thinking. Now there is certainly some truth to the statement that the Bible says it, that settles it for me. Yes, we definitely should take the words of Scripture seriously and at face value. We should not read the Bible in a mystical or allegorical manner. But this does not eliminate the need for interpretation. Otherwise, all would come to the same conclusions, but we don't. And some literalistic reading of the Bible can lead to rather strange and even wrong conclusions. Let me give you one example. Especially people who are new to the faith sometimes use the Bible as a kind of oracle book. They blindly open the Bible and then take very literalistic what the Bible allegedly tells them to do. So the story is told of a man who did this and with his closed eyes he opened the Bible to Matthew 27 verse 5 to find out what God wanted him to do. And there he read, then he threw down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. Well, this was not what he expected he should do. And so he opened his Bible again, pointed to another passage and read from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 10, verse 37. Then Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. Here even Jesus spoke. But still he was not sure, and so he opened his Bible a third time to John chapter 13, verse 27, where again Jesus spoke. Then Jesus said to him, what you do, do quickly. Now we might smile at this episode, but it illustrates an important aspect of biblical interpretation. If you take a passage out of context and read them literalistically, you can come to very wrong conclusion. It can even end deadly for you. Because you have not given adequate attention to the context of those biblical statements. And this is where interpretation starts. I recently saw a statement that said, I can do all things through a passage taken out of context. Yes, with a Bible text that is taken out of context, you can do a lot of things. And many people come up with all kinds of strange and twisted conclusions when they take Bible verses out of context. And that explains a lot of wrong teachings that are done even in the name of the Bible. And by the way, the same holds true when we read the writings of Ellen White. A Bible verse without its context quickly 
becomes the pretext for one's own ideas and agenda or whatever the interpreter wants to convey. But then the biblical text no longer determines its own meaning, which is implied when we say sola scriptura by scripture alone, but I, the interpreter, shape the meaning. And when the Bible no longer functions as its own interpreter or as the final, the decisive norm for our theology, the text taken out of context only legitimizes the individual preference of the interpreter. Then the Bible has effectively lost its liberating and corrective power. And if you would like to learn a little bit more about these effects on the meaning and the interpretation of the Bible, read the new book, Biblical Hermeneutics, An Adventist Approach. So here are some reasons why interpretation is necessary when we read the Bible. Number one, the Bible was written in another language than most of us speak today. The Bible was written in the Old Testament in Hebrew and some parts in Aramaic, and the New Testament was written in Greek. So if you read your Bible in English or Spanish or Portuguese or French or German or Mandarin, Chinese or whatever other modern language you speak, it is a translation of the original Greek and Hebrew. And as every good translator knows, Every translation is always some interpretation because there are some words and some concepts in one language that are very difficult to adequately translate into another language. There are some Bible translations that are more literal or formal, word by word, and there are other translations that are more functional or freestyle where they do not translate word by word, but give a more modern equivalent meaning to the message. Now, when you want to study carefully what the Bible teaches, a more literal word by word translation is to be preferred. And even better than that would be if you could learn the biblical languages and master them. This is, by the way, why we include Hebrew and Greek in the theological training of our pastors, because it helps them to understand the original meaning of the biblical text. By the way, if you were a Muslim and wanted to study the Quran, you would have to learn to read it in Arabic, because they believe that this was the language in which it was given, and it really cannot be translated adequately into any other language. Now, if they do this in their study of the Quran, why not do something similar and learn the biblical languages? Why don't you ask your pastor to help you learn some Greek or some Hebrew and start to explore the Bible in the very languages in which it was originally written? I believe it can open up valuable new insights into God's Word for you, and you will understand the Bible even better. If you would like to learn more about different Bible translations and the different Bible manuscripts and how they affect our interpretation of the Bible, you should read chapter 3 in the new book, Biblical Hermeneutics, An Adventist Approach. Here is a second reason why interpretation is needed. The Bible was written in another time and another culture. Some of the things we read in Scripture sound strange to our Western ears and our individualistic Western culture and can only be understood adequately if you have a better understanding of the times and the culture in which it was originally given. So if you want to explore the fascinating questions of what in the Bible is universal in application and what is time limited and what biblical and text-based principles can guide us in determining these important questions, I encourage you to read chapter 5 in the new book, Biblical Hermeneutics, An Adventist Approach. 
Here is a third reason why interpretation is needed. See, we are human beings, and we are not God. God is transcendent. We are created beings as, and as such exist to live in close relationship with God. Unfortunately, however, we have fallen in sin and have separated ourselves from God. Because of that, we attempt to live independently from God. We want to be autonomous. And in this, our pride, we easily distort the clear message from God and tend to give it a self-centered interpretation where we are at the center of the meaning rather than God. This sinfulness leads us to distort the meaning in our favor rather than to follow what God has said joyfully and obediently. For the Bible, Bible was uh, not merely written to us to provide some intellectual information about God, but it was given to lead us into a faithful relationship with God in which we practice what he tells us to do. And for this, we need the special help of the Holy Spirit in our interpretation. If you would like to explore some of these questions in greater depth, you should read chapter 2 in the new book, Biblical Hermeneutics, An Adventist Approach. So why is the topic of hermeneutics so important? My answer would be because the issue of hermeneutics is the most foundational issue in theology. It is perhaps not the most important question. The most important question is the issue of our salvation. But how do I know about God's plan of salvation and what God wants us to know about his gracious salvation? I will come to completely different conclusions if my interpretation of the Bible is not in harmony with the Bible itself. If statements are taken out of context, and this holds true not just for the issue of salvation, but for every other doctrine we teach and for everything the Bible teaches. In a sense, the issue of hermeneutics is like a watershed in theology. I come from Central Europe, and in Central Europe, where I come from, there are two of the largest and longest rivers of the continent, the Danube River, that eventually ends up in the Black Sea, and the River Rhine that ends up in the North Sea or the Atlantic Ocean. The place that determines the watershed for those two rivers, that determines where the water of those rivers and all the supporting rivers and creeks are flowing, are not the highest and the loftiest mountains of Europe. It is the area of some soft rolling hills in southern Germany. And there it is decided where the waters will eventually end up. The rivers may wind and take many different turns, but eventually they will end up in the Black Sea or the Atlantic Ocean. Now in a similar manner, it is in theology, depending where you begin and with what presuppositions and methods you approach the Bible, you will come up with vastly different conclusions. This is one of the reasons why the issue of hermeneutics is so hotly debated in theology and even within the Adventist Church. It is this issue that basically impacts all other questions in theology. See, no one approaches the Bible with a blank or empty mind. We all bring different education, different experiences, different presuppositions with us, and they influence how we read and interpret Scripture. And we have to allow Scripture to shape and influence and even change our presuppositions so that they are in harmony with the Bible. If you want to learn more about the importance of presuppositions in our interpretation of the Bible, you should read chapter 1 in the new book, Biblical Hermeneutics, An Adventist Approach. But there is yet another reason why the issue of hermeneutics is so important for Adventists. 
perhaps even more important to us than to some other Christians. See, we Adventists claim to go by the book, by the Bible alone, sola scriptura. But if we truly go by the scriptures alone, the issue of biblical hermeneutics is even of greater importance to us than for other Christians because they have other interpretive sources next to the Bible, church tradition, creeds, the teaching authority of the church, the magisterium, etc. But we, Seventh-day Adventists, we don't have a teaching magisterium. We don't have a pope. We only have the scriptures as the basis and foundation of our theology. So if we use methods of Bible interpretation that deny the self-testimony of scripture, we start cutting the very tree upon which we sit, and this leads to an identity crisis. If you want to learn more about some of those methods that are foreign to scripture, and the implications they have for our theology, you should read the new book, Biblical Hermeneutics, An Adventist Approach. There you will see how it impacts our understanding of creation, of marriage, of the Sabbath, and of many other things. Much more could be said when we talk about Biblical Hermeneutics. But allow me to briefly address some aspects that we often do not adequately take into consideration. And that is the impact of other sources on our theology and on the interpretation of the Bible. Sola Scriptura, Scripture alone, does not mean solo Scriptura. Sola Scriptura does not exclude the insights and the wisdom of other sources from which we can learn. Sola Scriptura does not mean that there is only one book, solo, that is available and should be studied, and that there are no other resources available to us. It reminds me of a story that is told of the largest library of the ancient world, the library of the ancient city Alexandria in North Africa. There's a legend according to which in the year 640, a Muslim general, Am um, ibn al-As, on the instruction of the caliph, destroyed this magnificent library with countless important manuscripts and books. And the caliph stated, if these writings of the Greeks agree with the Book of God, i.e. the Quran, they are useless and need not to be preserved. If they disagree, they are pernicious and ought to be destroyed. Sola Scriptura does not support such a narrow-mindedness. In fact, even Ellen White had a personal library of more than 1,500 books that the, she enjoyed reading. That is more than many of us have. She was not against the insight from other areas of learning. Sola Scriptura does not mean that we cannot benefit from other insights and other sources. But when it comes to the final authority, when it comes to the highest norm that decides matters of faith and practice, it is Scripture and not other sources that has the final word. See, even if we claim to go by Scripture alone, our understanding of the Bible is significantly shaped and influenced by a number of other factors. The traditions we are used to grow up with, the way we are trained to think, and how we use our reason in explaining things the experience we have had with certain people and ideas, and the formative culture around us. The priority given to any of these sources, or combination of sources, has a significant influence on our theology and often influences the emphasis and even entire direction of the theology of some churches. See, there are some churches 
where tradition plays a significant and ultimately determining role in theology. And the Bible is interpreted through the lens of tradition. In other churches, our experience becomes the decisive factor and claims a place that ultimately is even above the Bible. For instance, the experience of some gifts of the Holy Spirit, like speaking in tongues or healing experiences, or the experience of the so-called inner light that guides and leads people, even contrary to what the Bible teaches. For others, the current culture is the norm for what we should do in theology and the church. And the church assimilates to the prevailing culture and is no longer a visible witness to God and His Word. Other Christians accept only what human reason can fathom. Now, in liberal circles, this leads people to doubt and to question the miracles of the Bible because miracles cannot be explained by human reason alone. On the other side of the theological spectrum, people apply the same force of human reason and they deny the biblical teaching of the triune Godhead because this is something that their reason cannot fathom. Allow me to reflect on this important point a bit more. Do we need to sacrifice our intellect, our reason, our thinking when we study the Bible? Does believing mean not knowing, as the philosopher Kant has proposed? My straightforward answer is no. A sacrifice of our reason is not required. Why? Because God has created us with the ability to think. Much of the Bible calls us to reflect upon what is written in the scriptures and stimulates our thoughts and thinking. The repeated questions that we find in the Bible like, what do you think? Or the related question, have you not read? They imply that God wants us to use our minds in understanding Him and His Word. While we can understand God and His will correctly and truthfully, we have to acknowledge that we will never fully comprehend everything about God. This is because we are created beings. We are not God. Furthermore, our thinking is darkened and affected by sin. But as Christians, we are not asked to give up our thinking. We should not sacrifice our intellect. But what is needed is a sanctification of our thinking. The decisive issue for us as believers is that we were created for fellowship with God. We were not created as autonomous and independent beings from Him. And this means that we are called to do our thinking properly, coram deo, as the people in Latin would say, that is, as someone who stands responsible before God. Biblically speaking, we are called to think in relationship with God and in harmony with His Word. Any thinking that aims at fundamental autonomy from our Creator denies our creaturely existence and is self-centered and thus in danger of misleading. The Apostle Paul, who certainly was not idle in his thinking, encouraged us to take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Much more could be said, but the time for this presentation is limited. And therefore, please read the different chapters on the book Biblical Hermeneutics, an Adventist Approach. Watch the videos that have been produced. You will find valuable information and things that will stimulate your thinking. And there is much to be explored in Scripture. And it is important that we study and interpret the Bible carefully and in harmony with the things the Bible affirms and thus arrive at an understanding that is characterized by discernment, 
and faithfulness to God's word.